there are a lot of Bitcoin miners that are bankrupt today because of SegWit and a lot and the transaction fees did go through the floor and they would have been higher if the block space had been uh, more scarce. And so there, you know, you can say the network survived and we are where we are. And I think that Bitcoin with Taproot and Bitcoin with Segment is a healthy network and we have enough functionality to 100x from here. But I do think every t- if you look forward, I mean, looking backwards, people were hurt, right? Like in, the, in the German Civil War, right, in the 30 years war, like one third of the people got murdered. There's no good guys. There wasn't a good side, right? Both sides murdered millions of innocent people in the war. Is some kind of benefit to, to one class to the detriment of everybody else in the world and everybody that's ever going to come in the future. So from now to the end of time, every human being that's ever going to live is going to be impaired by some constraint that's in- introduced by some enthusiastic political actor that thinks that they were, you know, given a mission from God to make the network better. And uh, generally, they're not right. Yeah. And so one other area I think people will want to hear your answer on is what about in the case of upgrades that are opt-in only? So as an example, if it was a particular, you know, opcode that uh, an existing node runner doesn't have to care about and it's only, you know, if, if it could be, let's say, for the sake of argument, it could be shown that there's no impact to existing users. You can just keep using Bitcoin exactly as it is. But there's this new opt-in opcode, as an example, that people can opt into and only use that if they choose to. What's your, do you have any view on that kind of idea? I generally think if it's marketed as an application by a corporation, like when Block wants to create cash app functionality and build it into cash app and people get it and it's, and it's otherwise compatible with the rest of the network, right? Good for you, right? <laughs> what's worth that? What, what's worth taking the risk of that, right? I, I, so I would tend to be very conservative with regard to anything that, that affects the balance of power between the asset, you know, and the transaction bandwidth and the power, you know, scarcity. Okay. Yeah. But just like someone would say, well, I did, you know, I think we should change SHA-256 SHA to SHA-512. Okay, great. So you invalidate all the technology that every SHA-256 Bitcoin equipment manufacturer has developed over the last decade. And then you introduce your own little piece of equipment and you basically obliterate or nuke $25 billion worth of capital investment by miners, right? You can see why it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It's like it's all, all those things represent moral hazard and, and they create, they create dysfunctional political incentive. Like, do, do you really want people to be continually campaigning to confuse Bitcoin operators? Like, like, why would you want to create a market in introducing fear, uncertainty, doubt, and each one requires a thousand hours? So now you've introduced like thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of debate, you know, and, and can you think of an example where that happens? It's like, yeah, the modern, modern political systems, right, where pretty soon 20% of all the citizens in the country are lawyers fighting with each other. Right, and then, right. and I'm I'm reminded of is it Aristophanes and his play where he, where he says first thing we do is we kill all the lawyers, right? <laughs> Might have been Shakespeare too, but who knows? It's like at some point, you know, the question really is if you have the ability to create code, why don't you create code on the network and not try to change the network? Right, it's it's much more constructive channeling. Of human endeavor. Yeah, so uh, I guess we've, we've covered then the Bitcoin uh, principles aspect. Is there anything around uh, Bitcoin dynamics that you'd like to discuss? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's worthwhile to touch on that, right? I mean, the real key with the network is that we want the network to be a basis of a cyber economy. We need to be interested in the, nat- the natural harmonics of the network and the natural frequency of the network. I would say it might very well be, it might keep growing for a decade. I mean, for a decade after Bitcoin mining is no longer economically rational for a standalone miner, the hash rate will keep going up because 
there are plenty of actors that have negative cost electricity or free electricity, and it'll be profitable for them. And you've got an equipment manufacturer that can sell the equipment at a 90% markdown. And at some point, it's kind of like asking, you know, will nation states ever stop buying munitions? Like you notice how cheap a gun is? <laughs> like there, you can buy guns that'll kill people for 50 bucks, a hundred dollars. Right? So it's so you're like, well, it doesn't seem like it's a very profitable business. Why do people keep doing it? <laughs> There are a lot of people that don't really care, right? That whether the gun is profitable, right? They're, they have another motive involved here. And so I think the same is true with, uh, with Bitcoin power equipment. Like, isn't it quite possible that at some point a nation state that has stranded energy or stranded capital re requires the production of Bitcoin mining rigs at a loss? And you're going to end up with the, all these massive questions about What's the machine that controls the throttling of the capital flowing in and out of the network? And what happens if you hack the machines? And so you've created something which is thousands of times more complicated than using uh, energy and the laws of physics. You know, and you're basically imposing computer science over physical science. And if it doesn't break the regular, you know, the regulatory guidelines and you basically created a, you know, an equity token by doing it, then you've created an unstable virtual reality system that, you know, one single bug in one line of a million lines of code and your entire system goes unstable and you've got a Boeing 737 MAX problem one line of code and it just wrecks the crashes the entire network. So so the the real beauty of bitcoin is it, it is that natural frequency and uh, and and that's by the way and that's what um protects the network or provides the network security in what I'll call a tactical sense on on any given day you have to go through that wall much less 5 billion. Right? So so it, you know, if I had to guess, right, how much mo how much real money has been put into Ethereum? A few billion dollars? Like the, the difference is 600 billion in Bitcoin. If you were to say 6 billion, I would say you might be stretching it, right? Like we're talking about a factor of 100 difference. Yeah, I don't think you can really get to a number that's more than a few billion, right? So I think that 99% of all the real capital has been put into this one network. Sailor advises to all investors to brace themselves for significant developments in the crypto market by 2024. The visionary CEO known for his strategic insights hints at transformative changes on the horizon. As anticipation grows, Sailor's counsel underscores the need for readiness in navigating the evolving crypto landscape, urging stakeholders to stay informed and agile in the face of potential market shifts slated for the coming years. If you found this video helpful, make sure you hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.